what a day! What a lovely day! <laughs> Welcome to the Mad Max Minute Podcast, the daily podcast where we break down Mad Max one minute at a time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minute 28, which begins with Max and Goose getting a call on the radio, and it ends with Goose talking to Dispatch on their way to the incident. So we transition into this minute from the last minute, panning across a field. I tried to read into the scene that we opened into straight from the car scene into this scene and it's of like a ruined homestead Mm -hmm. i actually have a a page of information all about this particular location that i pulled from madmaxmovies.com yeah um do you want me to go into that now or do you want to do we want to evaluate evaluate it a little bit well real quick i actually so i wanted to find symbolism and i just couldn't quite Mm -hmm. get there I mean, it's, I think it's a little obvious that we go from the the scene of this, the destruction of the car and the assault on the people themselves, and we go straight into the scene of a destroyed home. Mm-hmm. I think the symbolism is just a little too obvious. A little on the nose. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it is there and it was purposeful. It's, I don't know, it doesn't really do anything for me. Yeah. Yeah. So this location, and like I said, this is pulled from an information page on MadMaxMovies.com, arguably like the best resource I've found about these (laughs) movies. This location, as it says on the page, in reality is only about half a kilometer away from the intersection in the opening chase of the film where Roop and Charlie and the Knight Rider have their crash. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, it's really hard to determine geography in this movie. Right, I feel like all the roads are straight and narrow. All of this could happen in like a two mile radius for all we know. Right. Just because everything is just straight roads and fields. (laughs) Going back to that question of geography also, when Max and Goose drive off in a few uh, seconds here, they actually travel down a straight road that isn't the same road that they're on in this shot. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's like, who knows anymore? Yeah. So this ruined building marks the location of the original settlement of Little River. Uh, the building was called the Traveler's Inn, and it was built at this location due to the river crossing. The The building had apparently been burnt down once previously and then rebuilt before burning down again, and eventually the rail line between Geelong and Melbourne was put through a few kilometers away from this site, and the town just collapsed. And the ruins is all that's left of a once thriving community. Oh. So it's not just this one house there used to be more and then this is all that remains of the inn interesting that'd be an interesting place to go a town i love ruins yeah little river historical society has their own website where they talk about this uh the whole area ruin patch here nice so panning across all of that we zoom in on max and goose talking to a young couple on a very peculiar looking motorcycle uh yes peculiar looking yeah so first and foremost it's a trike it's not a motorcycle in and of itself and it's got this really wide sidecar with a clear dome Mm-hmm. and it's just now as something else. a motorcycle passenger i wouldn't be caught dead in that thing <laughs> like i don't i don't get it like you just don't understand the appeal of i yeah I I don't understand the appeal. I mean, part of the joy of riding a motorcycle is being like out Mm -hmm. and free and, and she has completely enclosed herself. Yeah. Like that's what a car is. Like it makes sense if you want to be a passenger in a vehicle, one person wants to be in a motorcycle and one person wants to be in a car. You put the person who wants to be a car in the little sidecar and put the dome down and then they don't have wind whipping all over them and then the other person actually gets to be on somewhat of a motorcycle that is the ugliest compromise i have ever seen it is it is gaudy i'll, I'll say that much yes. so i was able to find on madmaxmovies.com a page devoted to this piece of machinery here okay so it's called the cyclotron or just the bubble trike and it was originally constructed 
by Lance Seaton of Cycle Gear in Collingwood. The scrolling on the body was done in 24 karat gold leaf by John Leach. Oh. Um, Lan- oh, it's a fancy bike. Oh, it's it's fancy, all right. Uh, Lance and John were both members of the Barbarians Motorcycle Club at the time. Uh, features of the trike include a tube running from the dome to the rider so that they could enjoy a smoke while they're riding. Um Interestingly enough, as late as 2001, this bike was still around and in pristine show material, uh, show condition. And it was okay, actually... okay. Can we come back to the tube for a second? Yeah, I can't actually find where the the smoking tube is on this particular in the dome. Okay, so the concept is this is how I'm picturing it in my head. The concept is that the passenger, in this case the woman, is smoking. Mm-hmm. And the smoke is being diverted, because it's the only place to go, into this tube, which is leading to the driver, who is then secondhand smoking? No, I, I read that. I, I said that strangely. The you tube, did. The tube in the dome allows the person smoking to blow smoke out of the dome so that it doesn't just hotbox them. Oh, okay. Because I thought they were hotboxing and then passing the benefits of the hotbox onto... <laughs> The driver. You know what? That could be the case. I don't know. Okay. It's, it's just a strange... Because that just sounds absolutely ridiculous to me. It's just such a weird looking thing. It is. And I mean, it is. later on we're going to see it driving away and it doesn't have a motorcycle tire in the back. It has two car tires. Right. One on the motorcycle side, one on the car, the sidecar side. Yeah. And it's just... I. That I, actually it, reminds me of... What's that British car... That has the two wheels in the back and the one in the front that like falls over all the all the time. I think it's called the Robin. Let me. Top Gear used to talk about it all the time yeah. and took it for drives, and um... it was just horrendous and hilarious. I'm gonna search three wheeled car. Because if you take this trike and just cover it over, it's that car. But it's interesting because you think of a trike as being more stable than a standard motorcycle. Right. And they're not going to tip over. Like, no. they look very, very stable and smooth. While this three-wheeled car, like, cannot, cannot not tip over. So the car you're thinking of is called the Reliant Robin. Um, okay, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that sounds right. It was in production from 1973 to 1981 in the UK. They tried to revamp it in 1989 till 2001. And apparently it was produced in a shorter run uh, from 2001 to 2002 between locations in England, locations in Greece. It's just awful piece of motoring. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this trike would be a whole lot more stable. Yeah. Because I mean, it, it... Because essentially it's just a motor car or... Because essentially it's just a motorcycle with a big old thing strapped to the side of it. Yep. Um, I was also wondering, getting away from the trike itself, how, what was the situation that they got pulled over? So I am guessing, I am guessing that this trike was pulled over not because they were speeding or doing anything illegal, but probably because Goose saw them riding by and wanted to talk stop to the girl. them and talk to them. Maybe initially just to look at the bike itself because it is such a bizarre piece of motoring. But at the same time, when we zoom in on them, Max is talking to the rider and Goose is talking to the passenger. Goose yes. is totally Mr. Steal Your Girl in this situation. Absolutely. <laughs> and I would like us to make a point of noticing... His behavior to her, because I'm going to bring it up in a couple minutes down the road. And he introduces himself, says, um, I'm Jim Goose. Puts his hand out to shake her hand. And then from what I can tell, he never really lets go of her hand. <laughs> um, so I just want us to notice that. Yeah. Because we're going to come back to it. Yeah, he definitely... In a couple minutes. You've used the phrase in the past, but Jim, Jim Goose is very proud of himself. Yes. Yeah. But it's funny because... I don't know how long they've been talking to this couple when we actually stumble upon them. It but seems like it must be pretty recent. Because... Pretty fresh. The A call comes over the radio, Max walks back to the car, and then Goose turns around and says, Oh, by the way, like, I'm Jim Goose. I'm Jim Goose. <laughs> what we know about Jim Goose so far, I would have thought that would be the first thing to happen. Exactly. So I think this probably is fresh. Okay, so leaving that behind, going back to... The, the call on the radio. So there's like a, a signal or an alarm that goes off. Yeah. And it's edited to us to be very loud. And I assume that it's very loud to them too. 
We've never heard that before. No. I mean, is there is there a setting on the radio that they like flip a switch and it's like we're not near the radio. If you need to say something, it's gonna it needs to make this noise. Like they flip a switch to enable the alarm or signal because we haven't heard it before. And if that's the case, why didn't it go off when Goose was in the diner? I'm, I'm pretty not sure he would have sure. heard it, but. I'm pretty sure this is a ringer that they can turn on and off. Yeah. One thing that differs in this scene from the earlier scenes is that Dispatch or Scuttle and Sarge were calling people specifically over the radio. What we hear here is the radio going off and then Max answering saying, okay, Rokitansky, go ahead. It's not so much that they're sitting there with dispatch saying MFP to whatever Max's call sign is. They're not sitting there calling. They're just doing a direct, I want to say like a direct message instead of a general broadcast, like a, a targeted call, okay, so to speak. Okay. Almost like a phone feature. I don't know how police radios work. <laughs> I feel like that's painfully <laughs> obvious that I have no idea how police radios work. But I think it is an alarm that you can flick on and off. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes the most sense. That's how it feels. Yeah. So So Max goes over to talk on the radio and the dispatch says, now you were able to pick out the words much better than I. So according to the subtitles, which is what I'm going to call my script from here on out, they're just the subtitles. Dispatch says, we have an incident at We Jerusalem, Nomad Bikers, Bulk Trouble. Okay. So We Jerusalem is basically Clunes Victoria. The um the city that we've been seeing these past couple of minutes, we've just been referring to it as Clunes, but in this movie, the context here it's called We Jerusalem. Now is it called We Jerusalem or is it called Jerusalem and they're calling it We Jerusalem? I mean it's not very big, so they could just be calling it We Jerusalem as a nickname, but mm. I don't know. Okay. It could also just be the name of the town. I went back and I was looking for signage. In the earlier scenes, be like, oh, welcome to town. And right. I just couldn't find any. Okay. So. All right. Well, it, yeah, I think we can safely call the town Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh, and then it, yeah, then it says uh, nomad bikers bulk trouble. Bulk as in trouble. Big trouble. Yeah. Okay. So I have a feeling that what probably happened is the station master noticed all of the guys oh. riding yeah. out following the Chevy. And decided, you know what, I should probably call the police. Yeah. And so that's probably why later on, Dispatch doesn't have any more information from them or for them. Yes. So Max says that they're on it and calls Goose back to the car. Yep. (laughs) And... So Goose is, like we said, totally flirting with this woman. Yes. Right in front of the other guy. And you said that you didn't necessarily see a lot of reaction from the guy. Yeah. Did you? Um, If you, you... There's the... The shot where Goose is still holding onto her hand and you can see the guy looking at Goose. I guess his stance is a little aggressive there. Yeah, the stance, the way he's kind of leaning over his bike and, and whatnot, you can kind of get the, the sense that this guy isn't very appreciative. And the girl doesn't seem into it necessarily, but no, she's also not, really. not, you know. She's in a very submissive position. Position, yes. Yeah. She's sitting lower than anybody else. Even if the guy was sitting on the bike, she's still sitting lower than him. And she's like trapped, like encased. There's no easy way out of that thing. Yeah. You can definitely tell as Max calls Goose over, Goose kind of realizes probably, okay, we stopped these people in the middle of their day and I was flirting with what's her face there. And so he turns around before he goes and he hands them this little slip of paper. Yes. Guy asks, what's this? And Goose replies that it's a get out of jail free card. So this is a great time to jump in with some IMDb trivia. Yes. Straight from the trivia page on the, for the movie. Which has been corroborated. Oh, yeah. This, this, is, this one we were able to confirm. This one was <laughs> mentioned several times in the behind the scenes documentary that there actually did exist a get out of jail free card for the members of the cast. Because everyone was just driving their production vehicles to set at each morning, and this is especially true for the members of the Acolytes. They had aftermarket parts that weren't necessarily legal. They had weapons strapped to these vehicles. And so they had a slip of paper from, I don't know if it was a detective or someone that actually existed, 
but it was basically a letter to the police officer saying that this person that you've pulled over is working on a production called Mad Max. And it kind of lays out the basic idea of the movie. And it's basically a request to that officer to give this person a little bit of lenience so yes. that they could finish and it, production. <laughs> and it looked very official. Like mm-hmm. it was, it had nice letterhead. Yep. Yeah, the seal of whatever and. And stuff on it. So it was their get out of jail free card. And I believe they had to use it, right? Oh, yeah. 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 The the crew that played the Acolytes, they probably abused that thing more than anybody. Yeah. But this little call out here is kind of a an inside joke for the people who made the movie. Who know exactly what the get out of jail free card is. Yes. And so I feel like Goose giving the get out of jail free card to this guy is sort of a, you know, we didn't have to pull you over. And in response for us inconveniencing you in this day. And flirting with your girl. Yeah, maybe we'll just give you this This... get-out-of-jail-free card for you to learn use next time around. Yes. I noted, knowing this behind-the-scenes story, I understand why Steve Bisley is amused at this little reference. Yeah. (laughs) But why is Goose amused? Like, he... (laughs) And I think I came up with my own answer. He's just always so freaking pleased with himself. Well... I mean... (laughs) <laughs> Everything he does, he's just so happy about. Because he did it. Yeah. He's such a high opinion of himself, but it's yes. like... Okay, if I was Steve Bisley as Goose, I'd probably be the same way, because he's the Goose. Yeah, you know? I guess so. What's good for the Goose is good is, for the Gander. I guess so. <laughs> um, I would also like to note Goose is walking. Oh, yeah. It is It varies. Okay. The last time a we lot. saw Goose... The absolute last scene where we saw Goose, he was in a cast that covered like 90% of his leg. Yes. And he could only move around with the use of crutches. Yes. Now, an indiscriminate amount of time later, he's got his knee wrapped up and he's just kind of slightly limping. Yeah, but sometimes he's like full on hobbling. Yeah. It's like, like sometimes he makes it look extremely inconvenient for him to be on his feet at all. Yeah. Yeah. What is really unclear, though, is... What injury he had... Yeah. ...that is taking this progression of healing. Yeah. So he's in a full cast. So, okay, so going back to the injury itself, it was caught underneath the bike. No, no, no. His leg, right leg, which is the one that keeps getting bandaged up and well, cast yeah, up, we had that wasn't incon- even underneath the bike. But we have that inconsistency. Yeah. The, the leg that he broke... Is the leg that got caught under the bike. Whether it was the left or the right, that's the one that is incapacitated. Yeah. Now, the passenger of the caravan who was like right outside the window or right inside the window. So he was right next to where Goose landed. He made a comment. That I think his leg is broken. I think, yeah. Can't remember. So that's really was. the only indication of the severity of the injury. Yeah. So let's just go with it. So either more time has passed than we are aware of, or Goose has like super mutant healing powers, which apparently is something that all Australians have because we have Hugh Jackman to look to. Very, very true. (laughs) Very true. So he's got the cast on, like the full leg cast. Uh, He's off the bike for work anyway, so he's on his own personal bike. And then unknown amount of time later, we see him here. What kind of break would you have that once you got the cast off, you could wear your regular pants and just bandage over the pants? Yeah, this is kind of ridiculous. I I just, I don't, I don't understand how he's healing and what the process is. I mean, maybe he also messed up his knee at the same time. It's really easy to mess up your so, knee. So, yeah. And so maybe now he's like bracing his knee. Actually, you know what? That kind of makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but I'm sticking by it that sometimes he's hobbling and sometimes he's barely limping. And then upcoming in... I think tomorrow the next we see him minute, We see him walking completely normal. Yeah. Yes. So it's like... And we know it's... Uh, and, and then we know it's only a few minutes after this scene where we see him hobbling. Yeah. So it's like, I, I don't even know what's going on. Right. At all. Right. So they all go their separate ways. The trike pulls away. And I... I I kind of appreciate that they actually see there's like a little switch or something that the trike rider presses and then the dome kind of lowers down. And so stupid. It's it's really dumb. It's just. It's like. It's such a it's you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of retro futuristic design. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. 
Like uh, in the 50s. Exactly. When everything was like futuristic. Yeah. And you see it like in commercials. I'm not sure if people's houses were ever really like this. But no, in like this commercials like from the day. Popular science magazines and whatnot. Right. Imagining what the future would and look like. And like everything was automatic at the push of a button and mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. That's this what is, it feels like. This is like if someone asked Hanna-Barbera in... As they were doing the Jetsons to just design a motorcycle, you know? Yeah. (laughs) It's just so funny looking. It really is. But they pull away. Max and Goose, they peel off. And then we get a vertical wipe. Yes. To the next scene. Which I thought was a great transition. It was very effective. Oh, yeah. I I wouldn't say that I'm like a big proponent of wipes. I'm more of a fan of just the simple cut. Or the crossfade. Yeah, generally speaking, yes. Um, But there's a time and a place, Mm -hmm. and I thought this was a good use. Wipes make me think of Star Wars. Yes. Because George Lucas used wipes so often. Yes. And every time he used them, they were in homage to older action-adventure movies and whatnot. Because wipes are nothing new. Like, it's, it's not a new trick in editing. I mean, it's been around since very close to the advent of film. But it's, you know, they're cool little effects, but it's also a good way to show that time has passed. It took them a while to drive where they're going. Yes. I mean, granted, it's already, time has already passed since the initial attack took place. So they're getting there late to the game anyway. Right. But it's a nice little feature. And I tried to, I tried to think to myself, okay, is this, is the use of the wipe because Star Wars came out in 1977? And it's like, well, they were filming in 1976. They were editing for I think 18 months after they finished shooting. Mm-hmm. So they might have added it later on, but I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to presume like that. That's a bit too much speculation for my taste. Yeah. But as they're driving along, Goose jumps on the radio and he asks Dispatch if there's any more details. And I love hate this little scene. It's pretty quick. Yeah, Goose jumps on the radio. So is there any more details? Dispatch, who before now never shuts up, Simply replies with, nope. And that's it. And I was just, I was tickled because we've made comments before about how she just keeps talking. And she seems to just find things to say if she doesn't have anything to say. Yeah. She just starts reading the rule book or something. And now she's got nothing. Yep. I really appreciate the expression on Goose's face after Dispatch says no. He kind of closes his eyes takes a breath, nods his head, and then replies, okay, we're gone. I've done that (laughs) in the past. What I do on a daily basis, a lot of the times I will get calls and I will be told by an intermediary that something is happening somewhere and I need to go check it out. And I say, do you have any more details? And often, more often than not, the reply is, nope. And so I know as I'm sitting there holding the receiver to the phone in my hand, that I'm going into a situation blind where I know something is off and I know almost instinctually that as soon as I show up, I'm going to be unprepared or under-equipped. And it is incredibly frustrating. Yes. And at least for these two, thank goodness, not for your job, their job is dangerous. Yeah. And being under-equipped or under-prepared, you know, could cost them their lives. Yeah. They have no idea what they're walking into, no idea how many people are there or how active the scene is. They get lucky that the scene is fairly inactive when they get there. Yeah. If they had arrived earlier when the entire gang was still there. Now, granted, we're kind of of skipping forward to tomorrow. Yes. but... But yeah, if they had arrived there earlier when... The entire gang was still there. They would have been vastly outnumbered. Especially especially how Toe Cutter feels about Max and the MFP right now. Mm-hmm. They'd be dead. Absolutely. Yeah. They would be dead. Their car would look like the Chevy. Yep. They'd be, and they'd be a be... warning on the side of the road type of thing. Yes. So, so I think it's very underplayed how close this was to being the end of the movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in the last half second yeah. not even of the movie after mac or after goose is done talking on the radio he sees something and he he uses the phrase hey max he looks and then he kind of trails off and then in the next minute max responds and we kind of pick up from there yeah and it's not really worth talking about what they see no um, we'll get into it 
But what I want to bring up is the fact that the line, hey, Max, he looks, the way Steve Bisley says it, instead of saying, instead of hearing, hey, Max, he looks, it sounds like he says, hey, Maxi, looks. <laughs> and it's like, it sounds like he's calling Max, Maxi. Maxi. <laughs> Which I could picture him doing. Yeah. Yeah. It just sounds weird. Yeah. Because he says it so quickly. And I think it sounds weird because the minute gets cut off. Yes. Usually when we have a sentence get cut off, we pick up with the other half of the sentence in the next day. And that's not the case here. No. There is no rest of the sentence. He just stops talking. Yeah. And we just we just lose that, that rest of the breath that where he trails off. Yeah. But that brings us to the end of the minute. Yep. And we'll get into what he, what sees, he sees and, and the eventual that. carnage that they roll up on yes, tomorrow. Yes, the next. Tomorrow is another dark episode. Yeah. But you know what's not dark? But you know what's not dark? Our website, which is madmaxminute.com. <laughs> you can also follow us on Twitter at madmaxminute and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash madmaxminute. Thank you for joining us for Mad Max Minute number 28. We'll see you tomorrow. Motorbikes and men, take me to the end of the